Okej, nu har jag jagat en stackars forskare och tjatat till mig en intervju. Så jag fick tio minuter, det var allt jag fick. Men jag tar vad jag får. Så ni får ta detta lite för vad det är, med det förutsättningarna i åtanke. Jag tycker att vi har med rätt mycket på tio minuter. Lyssna så får ni avgöra. Today I have the pleasure and great honor to interview Professor Philip Grant Sean. And I will actually read this introduction directly from my notes because it's too many words to memorize. So, Professor Philip Grant Sean is a Danish scientist working in environmental medicine. He is the head of the Environmental Medicine Research Unit at the University of Southern Denmark and a young professor of environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health. Grant Sean is also a co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of the journal Environmental Health and consultant for the National Board of Health in Denmark. He is known for his research into the developmental toxicity and adverse effects of certain environmental chemicals to which children are commonly exposed to. And today we will be talking about fluoride. Uh, would you please start by telling us a little bit about your research and for how long have you st studied this area of environmental chemicals and how did you arrive at your result? I mean, the the issue in, in my mind is that um, Fluoride is, uh, well, it's added to toothpaste, but it's also um, added to drinking water in some countries. So it's believed that uh, it has a, a beneficial effect. I'm concerned that the proposers have overlooked that fluoride uh, does have toxic effects. We studied that uh, way back uh, in the 1970s. The point was that fluoride poisoning was discovered in Copenhagen in the 1930s because cryolite, which is a, a mineral ore, was mined in Greenland the only place in the world where cryolite does occur naturally. And then it was transported to Denmark um, and cleaned at the cryolite factory in Copenhagen. And uh, the workers were exposed to something like maybe 20 milligrams of fluoride every day. And we got hold of the, uh, the worker names and employment durations and we checked their medical records and mortality and it turned out that the longer the men had been employed at the factory the greater the uh, cancer incidence uh, and cancer mortality in particular bladder cancer now that has not uh, been followed up anywhere in the world, and I and our reports uh, are barely cited in the literature. So when other colleagues l started looking at fluoride as a neurotoxicant, that is, that it affects the brain development in children, then uh, we we started looking at that as well and um, something like 10 or 15 years ago we published a summary of the data mainly from countries like china but but also from uh, several other countries because in those countries there are areas with high fluoride contents in the soil so that the drinking water gets contaminated and this strong um, evidence from china clearly suggested that uh, children could very well lose like five or six IQ points per milligram of fluoride in the drinking water. And the advantage of, of the populations was that at the time, then uh, Chinese populations did not move a whole lot, particularly in the countryside so that if a child was born in an area with high fluoride, 
then that child was very likely to grow up there. And, and therefore, we, we thought the evidence was very strong. One of my co-authors uh, uh, was originally born in Hong Kong and spoke the language. And so we were able to collaborate with Chinese colleagues and ask them critical questions. Uh, so we, we published this. And the interesting thing is that the United States National Toxicology Program did exactly the same kind of study about two years ago. And um, they found the same thing. They found exactly the same from a larger database. But was ha what has happened is that health agencies in America have objected to publishing this. So we are only allowed to see a draft version that has been going back and forth for a couple of years because it has been blocked. Now, in the meantime, a couple of epidemiological studies, new studies have been carried out where under Western conditions, children were followed from the time of birth, urine samples were obtained from the pregnant mother, and that the children were re-examined later on. This is what we call prospective cohort studies. We, we also carried out one in Denmark in, in the community of Odense in the middle of the country, uh, where the fluoride concentration in drinking water is very low. Uh, the two other studies um, were carried out in Canada and Mexico. And so what we did was to merge the information from the three studies. And we were able to see that if you wanted a safe limit, uh, the way that uh, governmental authorities define safe exposure limits, you need to go below 0.2 milligrams per liter of drinking water, which is going to be very hard to, to get in, in certain countries. In America, the, the current uh, fluidation is 0.7, which is more than threefold what, what you know, our data suggests is actually safe. We also looked at the animal data and a variety of other studies, and we believe that we're looking at something causal. Uh, we're not yet sure about ADHD. There is some association between fluoride and the development of ADHD, but it, it's only preliminary. So, um, the current situation is that we need to limit our fluoride intake as much as possible. However, dentists insist that fluoride is good for the teeth, and we support that. But it's on the outside of the teeth. It's not to swallow the fluoride. And so we, we looked at... Uh, fluoride excretion in the urine of a Danish uh, pregnant women, and we found that a couple of them had very high levels in their urine. And so uh, we checked their information, and it turned out that those were the women who were swallowing the toothpaste when they were brushing their teeth. They didn't spit it out like they should do. Don't swallow it. You don't need it in your body. A pregnant woman doesn't need it because she's going to pass it to her fetus and it can get into the fetal brain. We know that. And therefore, especially pregnant women and small children should not swallow excess amounts of fluoride. And the other large exposure source is tea, particularly black tea. And there, there are certain types of tea uh, from areas in China, for example, and India, 
where there's a lot of fluoride in the in the ground this will be um, sucked up by the tea plant and concentrated in the leaves and when we dry and ferment the uh, tea leaves fluoride is concentrated and this is dissolved when you make your a cup of black tea so um, a, a few cups of uh, black tea and uh, you can get as much as one milligram of fluoride of in, in your intake, which is clearly not good. So I would propose that fluoride is taken seriously and that we start labeling black tea. And, and of course, you know, fruit teas or herb teas or uh, perhaps even green tea so that consumers know uh, which tea brands are high in fluoride and so that they can take their precautions, especially in regard to small children and pregnant women. Thank you so much for sharing this information and this knowledge. What seems to be a link between fluoride exposure and neuropsychiatric disabilities in children, is this known in the scientific uh, community and, and does our, our governments know about this? I would think so, but, but the experience from the United States where the agencies have blocked publication of a um, review document of very high quality that has been reviewed by several authorities, it uh, gives me a little bit of a he hesitation. Do these agencies really want to serve the public good or do they want to rely on decisions that they made perhaps 50 years ago? And I think the time has come to realize that fluoride does a lot of good for certain purposes and that'll make the dentist happy, but it should not get into the body. To finish this up, what can people do themselves to reduce the risk of being exposed to fluoride? I, I hate to say this, but um, since you're calling from Sweden, I, I have an example of mineral water from Sweden that's uh, exported internationally. Uh, it's called Ramlösa. And Ramlösa gets its water from particular, you know, very excellent sources. But unfortunately, it has a high fluoride concentration of, I think it's more than two milligrams per liter, which means that one little bottle of uh, Ramlösa mineral water may contain as much as, as, well, close to one milligram. So I would suggest that pregnant women and small children stay away from that particular brand and that Swedish authorities uh, try to make sure that mineral water in the country uh, stays preferably below 0.2, that is one-tenth of what, what is in a Ramlosa. Uh, and perhaps the, the company can, can find better sources for their excellent project, pro product that unfortunately is, um, is tanned by, by uh, the fluoride concentration. That's wonderful, Philip. I can see you are passionate about this, and I'm as well as very passionate about health overall. Uh, so thank you again for this important information and knowledge, and uh, the best of luck to you, and have a great day. has been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. What think you about this? Mina personliga tankar är så här att jag försöker alltid att minimera hälsofarliga ämnen i den grad jag kan. Därför känner inte jag personligen för att använda flåretankräm till varken mig eller mina barn. För visste du att vi har köttlar i munnen med ett transportsystem till resten av kroppen? Det är därför bland annat man ger epilepsimedicin in i munnen upp mot tandköttet och kinden. Därför att då kan kroppen ta upp de här ämnena. Och självklart gäller ju det alltid stoppar i munnen tänker jag. Inklusive flåretankräm. Så återigen, jag tar personligen det säkra för det osäkra. Och därför har vi valt bort flåretankräm i vår familj. Men vad? Vad händer med tänderna då? 
Ja, alltså det finns ju andra ämnen som också verkar bakteriedödande, det vill säga dödar karies, som inte är hälsoskadliga. Vår äldsta tjej, hon har aldrig fått så mycket som en droppe flåtandkräm och hon får alltid 10 av 10 när vi är hos tandläkaren. Och tandläkaren vet hon inte om det här. Och det är mest för att jag inte orkar köttet, om man ska vara ärlig. Men vad jag har förstått så är den mekaniska delen av tandborstningen också jätteviktig. Jag vet att bland annat, jag tror att det är munkar i Thailand som torrborstar deras tänder och sedan gurglar de något speciellt antibakteriellt grönt te, om jag inte minns fel. Så det här är så här typiskt oss i västvärlden som vi ska ha kemikalier till allt. Men som alltid, gör din egen research och ta sedan det beslut som känns bäst för just dig. Jag hoppas ni fick med er lite matnyttigt av detta så ses vi snart igen. Puss!